Hi everyone, welcome back to this video on the history of computers. The microelectronic revolution. Vacuum tubes were a considerable advance on relay switches, but machines like the ENIAC were notoriously unreliable. The modern term for a problem that holds up a computer program is a bug. Popular legend has it that the word entered the vocabulary of computer programmers sometime in the 1950s when moths attracted by the growing lights of vacuum tubes flew inside the machines like the ENIAC caused a short circuit and brought work to a juddering halt. But there were other problems with vacuum tubes too. They consumed enormous amounts of power. The ENIAC used about 2,000 times as much electricity as a modern laptop and they took up huge amounts of space. Military needs were driving the development of machines like the ENIAC, but the sheer size of vacuum tubes had now become a real problem. ABC had used 300 vacuum tubes, Colossus had 2,000 and the ENIAC had 18,000. The ENIAC's designers had boasted that its calculation speed was at least 500 times as great as any of any other existing computer machine, but developing computers that were an order of magnitude more powerful still would have needed hundreds of thousands or even millions of vacuum tubes, which have been which would have been far too costly, un, wildly un, and unreliable, so a new technology was urgently required. The solution appeared in 1976 thanks to three physicists working at Bell Telephone Laboratories, Bell Labs, John Bardeen, 1908-1991, Walter Britton, 1902 to 1987 and William Shockley 1910 to 1989 were then helping Bell to develop new technology for the American public telephone system so the electrical signals that carried phone calls could be amplified more easily and carried further. Shockley was leading the team, believed he could use semiconductors materials such as germanium and silicon that allow electricity to flow through them only when they are treated in special ways to make a better form of amplifier than the vacuum tube. When his early experiments failed, he set Bardeen and Britain to work on the task for him. Eventually, in December 1947, they created a new form of amplifier that became known as the point contact transistor. Bell Labs cre credited Bardeen and Britain with the transistor and awarded them a patent. This enraged Shockley and prompted him to invent an even better design, the junction transistor, which had which has formed the basis of most transistors ever since. Like vacuum tubes, transistors could be used as amplifiers or as switches, but they had several major advantages. They were a fraction the size of vacuum tubes, used no power at all unless they were in operation, and were virtually 100% reliable. The transistor was one of the most important breakthroughs in history of computing and it earned its inventors the world's greatest prize, the 1956 Nobel Prize in Physics. By the time, however, the three men had already gone their separate ways, John Bardeen had begun pioneering research into super conductivity which would earn him a second Nobel Prize in 1972. Walter Bratton moved to another part of Bell Labs 
William Shockley decided to stick with the transistor, eventually forming his own corporation to develop it further. His decision would have extraordinary consequences for the computer industry. With a small amount of capital, Shockley set about hiring the best brains he could find in American universities, including a young electrical engineer, Robert Noyce, 1927 to 1990, and research chemist Gordon Moore, 1929. It wasn't long before Shockley's industrial and bullying management style upset his workers. In 1956, eight of them, including Noyce and Moore, left Shockley Transistor to found a company of their own, Fairchild, Fairchild Semiconductor. Just down the road, thus began the growth of Silicon Valley, the part of California centered in Palo Alto where many of the world's leading computer and electronic companies have, be, have been based ever since. It was in Fairchild's California building that the next breakthrough occurred, although somewhat curiously, it, ha it has also happened at exactly the same time in the Dallas laboratories of Texas instruments in Dallas a young en engineer from Kansas named Jack Kirby 1923 to 2005 was considering how to improve the transistor the transistor although transistors were a great advance on vacuum tubes one key problem remained machines that used thousands of transistors still had to be hand wired to connect all these components together the process was laborious, costly and error prone. Wouldn't it be better, Kirby reflected, if many transistors could be made in a single package. This prompted him to invent the monolithic integrated circuit IC, a collection of transistors and other components that could be manufactured all at once in a block on the surface of a semiconductor. Kirby's invention was another step forward, but it also had a drawback. The components in his integrated circuit still had to be connected by hand. While Kirby was making his breakthrough in Dallas unknown to him, Robert Noyce was perfecting almost exactly the same idea at Fairchild in California. Noyce went one better. However, he found a way to include the connections between components in an integrated circuit, thus automating the entire process. Integrated circuits, as much as transistors, helped to shrink computers during the 1960s. In 1943, IBM boss Thomas Watson had reputedly quipped, I think there is a world market for about five computers. Just two decades later, the company and its competitors had installed around 25,000 large computer systems across the United States. As the 1960s wore on, integrated circuits became increasingly sophisticated and compact. Soon engineers were speaking of large-scale integration, LSI, in which hundreds of components could be crammed onto a single chip, then very large scale integrated VLSI, when the same chip could contain thousands of components. The logical conclusion of all this miniaturization was that someday someone will be able to squeeze an entire computer onto a chip. In 1968, Robert Noyce and Gordon Moore had left Fairchild to establish a new company of their own. With integration very much in their minds, they called it Integrated Electronics or Intel for short. Originally, they had planned to make memory chips, but when the company landed an order to make chips for a range of pocket calculators, history 
headed in a different direction. A couple of their engineers, Fred, Fredrico Fagan, 1941, and Marcian Edward Ted Hoff, 1937, realised that instead of making a range of specialist chips for a range of calculators, they could make a universal chip that could be programmed to work in them all. Thus was born the general purpose single chip or microprocessor that brought about the next phase of the computer revolution. Uh, so that's it for this video. In the next video I'll cover personal computers. So uh, please like and subscribe and thanks for listening.